Hello and welcome to a very special Japan by River Cruise. I'm Bobby Judo. And I'm Ollie Horn. And on this week's show, we're joined by all of the Bryans who bought advanced tickets for our now canceled Japan by River Cruise Christmas River Cruise. We thought it would be nice to all hang out together in a low audio quality Zoom meeting instead of just, you know, refunding their money. Thanks for being here, Bryans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, thanks. Thanks. Hey, yeah, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Terrible. On this week's show, what's your favorite Christmas in Japan trope? Is it Kentucky Fried Chicken? Or how about love hotels? Ours is when non-Japanese creators recycle last year's content about Christmas tropes in Japan. We'll do some of that. Plus, Ali's got your weekly recommendation. Ali? Yes, this week's recommendation is our top three Japan-based podcasts of 2020 that we recommend listening to when on the water. In the first place is Brett and Tony's Tokyo Kampai. Two dudes in their 30s in their first years of their non aikaiwa life have the time and disposable income to buy two short SM7Bs and just riff for an unedited hour of pure, unfiltered bro talk. If structure offends you, then this is the podcast for you. In second place is Beginning Japanese with Alice, NYU student at Waseda, chronicles her impressive journey as she encourages us during her exchange year to learn all 46 hiragana characters, character by character, in order of difficulty as she sees them. We recommend starting with the 56 minute episode on Nu. And in third spot, Nikkei's Asia, Japan Deep Think. They promote it. They love it. Promote it. It's a podcast which is hosted by Cambridge grad Owen, who has landed so hard on his feet being salaried to produce a weekly podcast, They're Sprained, which explains all of the rehabilitative hikes he does. Also, if you thought it was too cold for a river cruise, think again. We'll give you some of our favorite traditional Japanese ways to enjoy a winter Japanese river cruise, like kotatsu seating, hot sake, and spending the whole ride on the heated wash lid. But first, soap talk. <laughs> Bobby Judo, Merry Christmas. Am I allowed to say that to a Jew? Are, it depends. Are you acknowledging that I'm Jewish? Not yet. <laughs> oh, you were just asking if I knew whether or not it was okay. Yes. Uh, sure. <laughs> okay. In that case, Merry Christmas. Speaking of holidays, we've got an awful lot of Brian's here. Ali, would you like to tell the Brian's when they can expect their, uh, their Valentine's Day presents? Oh, yeah, that's right. So uh, <laughs> those people that donated money to the show, uh, our previous guests, we kindly uh, sent out a um, New Year's card, but we didn't specify which New Year it would be. So on a technicality, <laughs> you might not get it for a while. Basically, I thought I was being clever by taking advantage of the global supply chain uh, that exists by getting nice quality quality stickers from America. They took two and a half weeks longer to arrive than I thought they would. And then in the end, I got postcards printed at a photocopy shop. So the, the terrible quality and uh, spent a bad day stuffing envelopes and uh, then took them to the post office only to find out that Malaysia is so hard in lockdown. I mean, any regular listener of a podcast has realized that I've been like stuck here for a year. Uh, I mean, I don't really feel like I'm, I'm, I live here now. This is this is me. Uh, I, um, I just didn't realize that the, the, they're not sending any mail. The only country that Malaysia will send mail to is Singapore. So well, you, I you literally took them all to the post office and there was a sign on the door that said, like, as of recently, they're no longer sending to most to most countries except Singapore. Yes. Yeah. By most countries, every other country, they even they even don't send to some places in Malaysia. But what I found astonishing was they employ three full time staff to explain this to people. Like it seems like it seems like that sign would suffice. But like they're so they're so well rehearsed at explaining because I tried everything. I was like, what if I send a parcel? No. Uh, what if I no? Um, and so I mean, it, surely it would be I don't know, it would be cheaper for them to to like, I don't know, just like pay for a bigger sign or maybe update their website. So what I did was I wrote all the cards. I've packaged them up. I've sent them to a friend in Singapore who I just hope is going to forward them on. It's going to take two and a half weeks <laughs> to four weeks to get to Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> They're quite busy. That's going to take another couple of weeks. So if you're expecting one of these cards, um, lower those expectations, please. But be reassured, we, we did send out Christmas gifts and cards. They will eventually get there through a bunch of international layovers. And when they arrive, they will have all of the COVID. <laughs> they'll, they'll have <laughs> from all over the world <laughs> yeah um maybe, is this a good time to uh, say that we uh, we're going to be selling merch um but uh, you, you can think of selling think of the merch as an investment you're buying futures <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah I've, I've been having my own uh international mail disasters i got my u.s uh corona money 
I got my my U.S. Corona stimulus check, um, and I had a hell of a time getting it. I had to file a couple of years of back taxes right. to get it to be eligible for it, which I got just under the wire. I think it had to be done by like November 21st. And I got it done like a week before and then was checking religiously to see whether or not it had cleared and processed. So I know whether or not I was eligible. By checking religiously, do you mean like doing what a Jew would do? Are you acknowledging that I'm a Jew? Uh, if I do, the then am I allowed to make it difficult? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But then then that joke kind of relies on the on the, the racist trope, which Jews care about money. So I'm conflicted now. If you acknowledge being a Jew, then the joke's OK, but also it becomes bad. If you don't acknowledge being a Jew, then uh, it, it's just it's just a joke about. Um, it's a shame that we're not editing you the guys, show, isn't it? Because this is <laughs> excuse Ali. He glitches out when he gets racist uh, this, this is this is the kind of joke which would comfortably end up on the cutting room floor but it's staying we're committing yeah you i all i know is that you were being super anti-semitic and my internet chose to not allow that through so oh good uh, all right yeah so, anyway, just, uh, you so anyway anyway you, you got uh, the money I, well i got approved for the money and then i got a notice that they had mailed it to the address that i had registered with on my taxes which should have been america but since i listed a japan address on taxes they sent me a physical check to japan Ooh. which is totally Ooh. useless i could do nothing with it so i had to mail that check back to america and hope that it got through and uh still haven't had word on whether or not it's arrived and it's just like it's it's so frustrating because compared to the Japanese stimulus money, the Japanese like Corona, uh, sur- the, the Japanese Corona stimulus that they're giving us, it's a world of difference because it's so incredibly difficult to get the money in America. Whereas in Japan, I just had to ask my wife to do it. And it was simple. <laughs> Very good. Um, what, what I like about doing this now is we're getting like live fact checked. So Brian uh, has said he was able to cash his check via his bank's iOS app, which it's funny because like on the one hand, it seems like Brian's flexing there by going, oh, look, I can use an app, but it's not yeah. really flexing because you're using an app to cash a check, which is <laughs> a technology which is like a, cen- a century old. It's a piece of paper which says, I promise to pay you something. Uh, well, I, I actually, uh, <laughs> Rick says, can we fax it? Uh, <laughs> I actually tried to download that app um, but you you can only download it if you're in the U S and so I actually was like looking up going through, uh, VPNs, oh, but it just wasn't, wasn't worth it. I just, uh, am hoping that it gets there. But the only reason that I even applied for that stimulus money was because it was just about the amount of money that I would need to renounce my U S citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. The, the final hurrah. <laughs> Goodbye. Farewell. Couldn't, couldn't you just ask them to donate to our buy me a coffee page? Uh, no, I, um, I, I think they don't consider us fans of the government. I think we've been a little bit critical of the administration. No, that's, that's true. That's true. And we do know that governments listen to this show. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, we've got uh, the, the comments coming through. Uh, Matthew Boynton says, as a, regular listener to the, as a regular listener to the show, I can reassure you that my expectations are already extremely low. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Uh, a previous guest on the show, thereby setting those expectations. Uh, very much a, <laughs> a, a self-own. Um, also, listeners can see that, listeners can't see, I should say, that uh, we can see kind of a, a sea of faces. Um, but Lewis Prawn, Brian, um, is is typing something which we can only assume is is hate mail and is just kind of get like, had like a little panda figurine focused uh, on on his webcam. So uh, that uh, is juxtaposed next to Rochelle Cop who is flexing with a virtual background of loads of books. So uh, showing the the the, the, di- the diversity um, of of our listeners and fans, very much a mixed ability group. Right, uh, Bobby, is there anything else to talk about? And so, to- oh, mail. Let's let's cover yeah, mail. Yeah. Uh, we got a mail from uh, a Brian in Fukuoka named Natasha. And um, this is really interesting to me because when we record this show, we kind of, we've even told our guests to kind of like assume that our listeners know the basics about Japan. And we've recently found out that we're starting to reach more and more people who are just kind of interested in Japan and don't necessarily um, have all the same information that we have. Our show that we published last week was with Go Takeuchi, Black Samurai, who's Good half show. Cameroonian, half uh, Japanese. And we regularly used the phrase half. And Natasha wrote in and she writes, hey guys, could we clear up if half person is an official term or something or a mistranslation? It sounds <laughs> really bad, but both. maybe it's a cultural thing I'm not getting. <laughs> I mean, the answer to that question is it's both. It's both official yes. and awful. Uh- <laughs> 
Yeah. This is something that, that, you know, we use it. I think most of us are used to using it. You kind of get accustomed to it until somebody kind of snaps you out of it. I remember I got snapped out of it when a Japanese woman uh, came up to me when I was out with my kids and she approached us in English and she said, Oh, you've got a half baby. I wish I had a half baby. And I was like, don't ever say you want a half baby. That is some serial killer bullshit right there. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, I think you and I even had a discussion where we said like, let's try and use mixed race where we can, but it just doesn't roll off the tongue. Yeah, I, I always try to use non-Japanese instead of foreigner and mixed race instead of half. Um, well, it's hard, isn't it? But it's, it's a can of worms. Uh, we've got a comment saying, for some reason, Zoom audio is around minus 11. Guess I'll have to listen to the official release. The official release. Uh, as if, yeah, this has got to go through production uh, until, it, uh, <laughs> until it gets burned to LP. Um, uh, so uh, Ollie and Bobby, oh, we tend not to read praise, so I won't read that bit out. Um, and then another Brian has given some, uh, some technical feedback saying it's not too late to check your audio settings for the selected speaker. So we'll leave the Brians to squabble about that um, as we take a look at the news. I've just realized that jingle was preemptive. We didn't actually answer the question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because this is yes. released without yeah. an edit, uh, there's no way of going back. So uh, how do we do this? I guess we get us back into soap top mode by playing the jingle, which everyone hates. No, no. Yes. Oh, and God. there we go, back into that. No. The look on people's faces. Even, even I can only handle this once a week. So. Uh, just back to the chat, um, the person who commented saying that they couldn't hear us very well said, actually, I think it's a lot better this way. So uh, <laughs> a big F you to you. Uh, Laurie, who wrote that jingle, um, if I have to answer that question, I'll have to play the other jingle we have, which is about my expertise in copyright law and about how I think we have an exception uh, <laughs> when we're using it. So, uh, Bobby, let's answer Natasha's question. Natasha, uh, half person. We're, we're using the customary Japanese way to refer to a mixed race person, which in Japanese they call half and um i i do think it's problematic i don't particularly like it uh my opinion has always been that when you call a person half it kind of diminishes them uh by about half i would say <laughs> in, <laughs> in terms of percentage it's about 50 percent <laughs> <laughs> but but uh it's one of those when in rome things um and i think maybe you might have noticed that uh black samurai called us gaijin as well that's that's also depending on who says it and how they say it some people find that problematic as well but um i don't know i think still to this day what do you guys think i find that most half people i know refer to themselves as half people oh uh the ob brian and fukuoka's got his hand up this is brian and fukuoka from brian and fukuoka <laughs> and um <laughs> As the only, I, I'm not sure by just looking, but I might be the only half person on the dais. But by the way, that is the way to tell. You just look. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, I've actually, Bobby and I have had this conversation and uh, I have no problem with, with half or even in America being called half. I think it's descriptive and even mixed race is is less descriptive it, it leaves the door open for a lot a lot so i mean leaving it at half period may be a problem but you know if you if you say half japanese i'm half japanese my mother's japanese i think that's fine and in japan too i've never had it used against me in a way that i thought it was anything other than you know being yeah like you were never or, you were never in a situation where they were like only half of you can come into the onsen Right, exactly. Either either it was completely all of me can't come in or <laughs> completely all of me can come in, you know. So anyway, that's my two cents. Yeah. But is there a way, well, not two cents, is it? It's maybe like one cent and a, and a few yen. Um, <laughs> is, um, but is there, is there going to be a point in three or four generations time when everything is just such a big mix where like, you know, and, you know just enough people just mix you know have i want to use the word fuck so i can There's enough people <laughs> enough people from different backgrounds fucked and then we eventually just all end up being some shade of beige right where like we can only really discern like a quarter of us was, was from there and an eighth of us was from there like well, is, in I, a few generations I mean, is the term going to become redundant i don't think that the current terms accurately reflect the reality because race is a myth generally speaking I mean, it's a big thing to say, but like, there's no definition of white. There's no, like what people consider uh, genetically Japanese is it's not pure Japanese. It's not the, uh, you know, Mindo. 
Takai as they think it is. It's mm. everybody's mixed already. Yeah. Um, and has got Brian, Brian in Seattle is laughing uncomfortably at this. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Anne has left an interesting comment, which is that uh, Anne has heard that some mixed race people complain that being fetishized um, as mixed race because they're prettier uh, seems to disregard the hardship they felt growing up. And it's a good point that just because something sounds like a compliment doesn't mean the recipient wants it. That is yeah. a good point. I mean, you you must get that with your children all the time, right? It's like, oh, they're, they're you, it must really annoy you because people must go, oh, they're so cute because they're half. Whereas yeah, you want to say, yeah. no, it's because I'm good looking. Bobby Judo's good looking and they have my DNA. That must really annoy you. Thank you for setting me up for one of my jokes and then doing my joke. Oh, my pleasure, man. I just want to get through the episode. Um, <laughs> And uh, Rochelle said there's a, there was a movement to change it to yes. double. Actually, that's interesting. Emmy wanted to use this. Uh, our, our mutual friend who used to work on the radio with us, uh, Emmy is mixed race. And yeah. she likes saying that she was double because she can speak both languages. You know, she, she knows both cultures. Well, uh, I remember seeing the original article um, from a mother. It was uh, a, a non-Japanese woman who had mixed race children. Her children were half Japanese. And I remember seeing the original column where she was advocating for the use of double for, for a more positive connotation. You know, you've got twice as much instead of half as much. Uh, and then I think, and I'd have to look this up, but I think some years later she came out and said it was well intended, but I realized later that it wasn't the best advice because it doesn't matter if you're calling somebody half or if you're calling them double, you're still pointing them out as different. Mm. You're still identifying that they're something separate from you know the rest of Japanese society. Yes, which I suppose is, is actually why people get annoyed by gaijin, right? I mean, people don't mind being descriptively called different, but I think people that have lived in Japan all their life or a really, really long time, they, they don't hate the word so much. They hate that it implies the fact that we see you as other, despite the fact yeah. that they may have lived in Japan longer than a Japanese person, or they may speak even more fluent Japanese. And there was a comment, I'm not, I think I've lost it, which is uh, gaijin is just short for um, bakanagai kokujin. It's a nice little joke there. Well done, whoever wrote that. Sorry, I missed it. I do, I do want to say I encourage everybody to go try and find this double article and then the follow-up because I feel like the woman in the follow-up mentioned that her children said something very similar to Brian and Fukuoka from Brian and Fukuoka, that her children are now adults and are fine with half. Right. Yeah, I mean, like you said, I think it it, it depends on, on who's saying it and why they're saying it, isn't it? And maybe yeah. the whole point is the word should be redundant because we should just stop talking about it. It's not interesting anymore, is it? Um, yeah. But anyway, at this point, uh, can I at least play half of the news jingle again? So speaking Bobby of Bobby Judah, are... what's in the news this week? Let me do it. Before it's, it's, it's again, now chaotic. Again, again. I was going to say, speaking of things are, that are totally redundant, the jingle is redundant because we're not going to talk about anything in, in the news necessarily. Uh, this week we wanted to, in honor of Christmas talk about uh, the Christmas tropes that we see every year. Twitter is a buzz, Facebook is a buzz with all of the Japan Christmas tropes. And Ali and I were talking about how we see these, every year you see a new Twitter personality in Japan saying, I wonder why Kentucky Fried Chicken is so popular. Um, and it's just kind of like this recycling of the same, the same content, everybody getting excited over the same things. The Kentucky mm. Fried Chicken, the Love Hotels, the uh, Japan is so focused on uh, Christmas as a romantic date night instead of a family holiday. Um, so we were wondering kind of if, uh, if everybody here was familiar with those tropes, what your favorite Christmas tropes are, and if you have any funny experiences or anecdotes about uh, tropes of Christmas in Japan. Just before we do, I, I have an observation, which is tinsel's really hot. And I don't recommend it as a scarf. So I'm only, is, sa I'm only saying wearing, this just so uh, I can remove it without <laughs> people wondering. It's like my neck's really hot. Uh, wow, I've never sweated that much in my life. This is awful. Um, all right, so yeah, tinsel does, tinsel, in fact, I would say tinsel makes a good, a good scarf if you're looking to actually keep your neck warm um, and look good. Um, so anyway, if any listeners, which, uh, if, if Zoom can manage ASMR, that's... Uh, <laughs> That's uh, that's low 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 bit rate um, <laughs> low bit rate um, tinsel. All right, Bobby. Well, sorry for um, sidetracking that otherwise excellent introduction. We can't edit that bit out. We have to keep it in. Hopefully, that gave people thinking time. What tropes are there? Laurie says, "I wish I was eating KFC in a love hotel right now." Well, that does combine both tropes, I suppose, doesn't it? It does. Um, yeah. 
and it's uh, yeah. also it's also yeah. good because you don't have to clean up the grease. <laughs> That's right, um, and um, and if you're saying it's finger licking good, then uh, you there's a punchline there. Uh, uh, <laughs> I um, yeah, I, it is one of these things that it seems to it, like it seems to reach international media every year without fail, as you know, as you know, Japan has somehow managed to create its own festivities. Isn't KFC amazing with its marketing? And on the one hand, like it is true. Like I remember being genuinely astonished driving uh, yeah. on Christmas Eve a couple of years ago and the traffic was like completely blocked, like just completely blocked. And we assumed it was a temple, right? We assumed that this like hour long queue uh, on the road was a temple. Uh, and, and in a way it was a temple, but it was a, a, a temple of chicken. Uh, and it was, it was KFC being backed up for, for miles and miles. So like the trope is true that KFC in Japan is a thing. But what astonishes me is that the world doesn't know about this yet because it seems like everyone loves to tell people. Yeah, I'm, I'm always surprised when I see like a first year Japan uh, uh, expat discovering it. Yes. Yeah, um, when I did, I saw on Twitter like yesterday, somebody posting, why did this happen? How did this get started? And you could find out just by searching Twitter, you wouldn't even have have to put in any search words you could just set the parameters for this exact same time last year and you would come across the exact same tweets just just by show of hands brian's who who has bought kfc this christmas chicken nuggets chicken nuggets <laughs> 30 30 chicken nuggets by yourself yeah but i hate myself by 21 so <laughs> <laughs> That, so I that's would. really interesting because I would always go for the 20 piece in McDonald's back in the UK, which is, isn't that interesting? If only their serving size was one nugget different, I would mm-hmm. develop that sense of self-hatred. But actually, I'm very happy uh, with, 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 with 20. Um, 30 chicken nuggets is enough to do a KFC advent calendar, isn't it? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> one, how bleak. One behind each door. <laughs> that's... Um, I, do you know what you joke right but this is the kind of thing which we joke about it now in two years time it will exist there'll be like there'll be, there'll be like a different dipping sauce or something you know yeah um so brian in seattle you're not brian in for Corker, but you do have kfc do you do that because of your fidelity to japan or do you just need an excuse but need uh need something that's not uh not western christmas food okay why this is, this is confusing to me it's because it's it's japanese christmas food <laughs> right do, but do you make when you go to kfc in america do you make a big, a big fuss of it do you do this whole performative oh konnichiwa oh sorry i spoke japanese then excuse me i didn't mean to do that um do you, do, 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 do you take a bow as they or, or do you get annoyed when they give you an english menu it's like dude we're <laughs> we're in america that's all we have <laughs> i i'm disappointed that they don't know about how big a deal uh, christmas is at kfc in japan yeah, well, because it could be a, it could be a big money spinner for them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to point out if people are still watching their gallery view that Louis Pran has replaced his panda with a can of Asahi that looks vintage, um, that looks imperialistic. <laughs> Is it, I don't yeah. It, <laughs> also, like there's flashing lights going on as well. Like if if we had to just take bets on 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 any of you that was going to be trolling us based on Twitter interactions, <laughs> like we'd probably would put money on Lewis and he's just, it just looks like he's trying to distract us with like flashing Christmas lights and just the corner of a windows desktop. Um, well, it's right. working. Um, Anne is engaging more with uh, Lewis Prawn screen in the comments than that, the show itself. <laughs> that's true. Uh, anyone that's listening to this uh, on audio later, please stick with us. Uh, don't, 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 don't let this be the so, point in which you, you back do, away. Do you guys know, uh, this might just be me. I had an experience where I actually tried to walk in to a Kentucky Fried Chicken on on I think the twenty third or the twenty fourth, and they don't just sell. They they like won't. The one that I went to would not sell me anything because yeah. they were only selling Christmas reservation sets, and you had to have booked them in advance. And also, I saw someone tweeted a picture of four security guards outside of of a, of a KFC the other day. They went, "Oh, four security guards. That means it must be, uh, you know, it, it must it must be Christmas." Um, <laughs> Anne's also calling you out for saying 40 years old when you refer to the imperialistic Asahi. Okay. Oh, well, it, it should be. The empire well, had fallen by then. <laughs> um, well, oh, it depends who you ask. There's, you know, those, those ambitions still, um, uh, <laughs> still exist. Um, 
Uh, and uh, it also brought up Christmas cake. Uh, does everybody, do you guys eat your Japanese Christmas cakes? No. Oh, All right. Good, We've gotten a lot of shaking heads. Good, good content. Thanks, guys. Uh, do you know the super sexist Japanese saying about Christmas cake? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Rochelle's oh, nodding her head Rochelle's in a very nodding. knowing way. Rochelle, would you Rochelle, like to, let's bring you in. Would you like to talk about this? Oh, Christmas cake. That's if you're um, a woman who's past 25 and not married yet. Why? Why is that Christmas cake? Why do they call it? Because that? you can't sell the Christmas cake after December 25th and 25th. So because nobody past... wants it after 25. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. But you can that still is... have really good sex with it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Everybody is cringing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> also, there's another, there's another pretty sexist one, which is the, the Fuji Bijin. Rochelle, do you know the Fuji Bijin? No, I don't. Oh, oh. It's, if you look at if you look at her from far away, she's beautiful. But the closer you get, the more it's on our kanji. This is that's not a well-known one. That's BJ Fox's joke. That no, it's up. not. He's not. He no, it's not. Really. Uh, I've, I've, I've heard it before that, um, but you know, he uses it well on stage. Um, again, this is kind of, this is exactly the kind of thing that we'd edit out, but we won't. We won't. Uh, We're not editing. No. Uh, good. Uh, all right. <laughs> so K KFC Christmas strips. The other thing I'd mention about KFC is, isn't KFC only nice when you eat it fresh? Like I cannot, like, I cannot imagine KFC being nice when it's been put in a bucket with a lid on. And let's be frank, steamed for an hour. But there's, there can't be anything nice about steamed fried chicken. Um, Casey Bean says non-editing is 100% liberating. Uh, yes, I mean liberating is 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 one positive way of describing what you do, uh, Casey. Um, yeah, guys, if you've never listened to Casey's podcast, uh, the Bean Pod, um, it sounds like he's at least three or four bottles liberated while he's editing it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, what a what a what a lovely euphemism. The Bean Pod is 100% <laughs> liberating. <laughs> Um, oh, by the way, yes, we, we should um, we should point out that Lawrence Bryan is actually tuning in from a train, uh, which is insane. Uh, presumably, you can't talk uh, unless you want to play a Gaijin card. I'm not sure how many have used this year. Uh, <laughs> Lawrence, can you can you tell us where you're going? Uh, Lawrence says, "What's up from Kyoto? Heading home from Christmas dinner at my boss's house. This sounds awful. Did you have uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken at your boss's house?" <laughs> no, what did you have? Uh, we are now waiting for Lawrence to type or do a gesture. Uh, if he did flapping wings, that would have been turkey. Uh, is he typing? He's presumably typing turkey from Costco. Turkey from Costco. There we hey. go. Okay, good. Hey, hey, that's another trope. Did you know that turkey was associated with Disneyland? For turkey legs. Yeah, 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 for, yeah, for the longest time. People go, oh, are you going to Disney? Oh, you must have a turkey leg. And that's now a thing. <laughs> like, what, what is it with poultry? Well, and wasn't that a thing in America also? Was it? Yeah, Disneyland in, in America sold turkey legs for as long. I'm, I'm seeing Laurie shaking his head. What happens to the rest of the bird? Hmm. It's interesting, isn't it? You don't, like, you don't see much turkey, do you? I actually, for, for, uh, little, this is a little peek behind the curtain. I wanted to get a sponsor this year from Turkeys. I wanted Turkeys to write the advert about how they was, were pleased that uh, they're only eaten once a year, right? You know, like, there's that, ex you know, there's that expression which is like, oh, that's like Turkeys voting for Christmas. Like they, Turkeys must be laughing at chickens, right? To think it could have gone either way. Turkeys have more meat on them, right? They're, they're, they're like a better value for money product. Um, but chickens are just, I mean, we've discussed, we've dis already in this episode without meaning to, we've discussed chicken in like five or six different forms, right? <laughs> like, like, whereas, you know, turkeys just once a year need to put up with it. Um, Matthew Boynton says, this is pod beef. Uh, another meat mentioned there for the record. I'm not drunk when I record the bean pod because I do it while waiting to pick my son up from soccer. Uh, you'd know that if you actually listened. Um, interesting. We don't, uh, uh, <laughs> No, we, we, we definitely, we, de we definitely do. Uh, we, although I, I, pref I prefer Summit to C. There we go. You've got your plug. Uh, right. So we've, we've discussed uh, KFC. Uh, we've discussed Christmas cake. Are there any other uh, Christmas tropes which we haven't mentioned yet? Date nights and love hotels. Oh, yes, that's good. Date nights in love hotels. Because the way that I describe it to my friends back at home is um, Christmas seems a bit like New Year in the UK. Like, I think you can reverse them. Like New Year is kind of a family time in Japan, isn't it? 
Yeah. Uh, whereas New Year in the UK, I would typically spend with my friends, whereas Christmas is is the reverse. And so that's why, um, yeah, that's why I think when people ask, you know, do you get do you get lonely at, at Christmas? Um, oh, okay, I might, should I be distracted by the chat? I think that, Bobby, at this point, we might just need to ignore the chat and just operate on a different frequency uh, to the Brian's and get through the, get through the episode. Uh, so, okay, so firstly, Love Hotel. That's another euphemism, isn't it? Like half, right? This is the kind of thing which we'd mentioned on the podcast once. And if people didn't know what a Love Hotel was, we would comfortably move on and they wouldn't know. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought of that. What's a Love Hotel? I don't know. I'm totally unfamiliar. Fantastic. This is not a concept that I can speak on. Uh, okay. Uh, who would like to admit to knowing what a love hotel is? Well, um, I, I sorry, remember... Sorry, sorry, sorry just... Mesa, Mesa, Mesa. Mesa. Um, Lo- Laurie wants the, to make it... Lo- yeah, the, Laurie... Only, the only person on screen with a, with a, with a girlfriend, I'm assuming. <laughs> not my girlfriend. Making it clear right is. now, not my girlfriend. All right, you're protesting a lot. Um, <laughs> and also, Laurie, you didn't see this, but I mean, she gave you a look as if to go, oh, well, you know, play your cards right. Um, <laughs> I, I guess, guess it depends. Guess it depends how big the um the bucket you buy today is, but um, <laughs> but, anyway. uh, L- Laurie, no matter no matter how you describe a love hotel, hello Rick Brian, um oh, has yeah. um has come up with an even better description, which is you have sex in them, <laughs> which um which actually could also be a description for for, for KFC depending on um how short staffed they are. Um, so Anne has given a proper description, which is hotel with weird mood lighting. You call it weird. I call it mood setting, Anne. Um, and rest or stay pricing, often used by couples because so many Japanese folks live with their parents, with their and, parents need and need privacy. Yeah, yes. this is so. This has been explained. I mean, I actually think that's that's a nice. Um, and also, Anne says, uh, "Ollie, stop fucking all the Christmas food." Fair play. <laughs> um, but Anne, so I've heard this description used a lot, right? That like a lot of people live with their parents, therefore you. That's why you need them. But I yeah. do. It, it might also just be that like, isn't prostitution just more prevalent in Japan? And so like that might also be a reason why there's 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 lots of them. And also, I know we don't like making these broad generalizations, but generally kind of a culture of having girlfriends uh, or, or, you know, having like or having sex with people who you're not married to is slightly less of a taboo in Japan. Than you other you mean a culture of cheating of like yes, extramarital I mean, affairs or well, having I, sex I, somewhere where you'd have to hide it. If you call it cheating, it sounds bad, Bobby. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> cheating cheating's a bad thing um if anyone would um would be interested in here in hearing an actual story like it seems like we're amongst friends um i do have a genuine story of uh having frequented a love, a love hotel once um with with with, with a friend frequented and, it once is an oxymoron uh yes <laughs> that's true <laughs> i once went and uh f- firstly uh, like just just like you know those rose sellers that sometimes come around restaurants in europe where like they're like, do you want to buy a rose for the lady? And you just can't haggle, right? Like whatever price they say, you have to pay. That, that's how they get you, isn't it? Because you can't go ten euros. She's not worth. Okay, fine, ten euros for a goddamn rose. Ridiculous. It's the same with the love hotel, right? No woman wants to shop around with you, which is like that's my instinct, right? I'll go. Okay, is that your best price? Fine, we'll try next door. After three, you're shopping by yourself. You're having to ask if you get a discount if you're going in, in going uh, alone. Um, but the, the little little peek behind the curtain here, in one of the um, less proud moments of my life. Um, the love hotel didn't provide something which is very important uh, to have uh, safe sex, which is which was mad to me. So I left to go to a convenience store and had a moment where they just cooked some fresh um, family chicken. chicken. Yes. And I and I thought I I would have time on the walk back. Like that, that was, that was, that was, that was I would have time, uh, but I I didn't. So anyway, that's that's a little little peek behind the curtain there. Um, I'm a <laughs> I'm a romantic at heart uh, matthew boyton says <laughs> yeah yeah so so i got the job done there didn't bother returning um, ali well while, while you haven't been paying attention to the chat the chat has just gone off the rails about you having sex with food uh yeah i mean obviously obviously you know it's a lot of oral sex um <laughs> <laughs> right come on come on right why why is it that when we get the brands together the show turns to smut we used to be uh, we used to be highbrow. Good. Okay, Laurie, back to some content. Uh, I got asked a question about love hotels at a job interview. Actually, Laurie, well, what was, was the job interview? And I was in a job interview for some some tech company, and they said they were looking at my CV and they said, "Oh, you're from so and so place in Fukuoka." Uh, and I said, Nakasu. Yeah, sure. And then they, and then they said, "Oh, that's very close to a very famous love hotel." And no I, way. That they literally said that, and I thought. Oh, how do I respond without kind of giving away the fact that I've been there? And I said, oh yes, 
the the sign is very eye catching, isn't it? <laughs> okay, and uh, is that what I they wanted to hear? I got the job. Okay, what was the job? Oh, it was crap. I quit through my slime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it was IT for a crap. Job. I wish uh, you said masseuse. <laughs> we had um when I was in Saga, we had a super a super eye-catching love hotel sign for a chain of love hotels. There were three of them. And they had actually made the, the list for like the ranking of the strangest names of love hotels in all of Japan. And the name of the love hotel was Hotel Banana and Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> and the sign was a picture of uh, anthropomorphic banana who looked kind of angry <laughs> and a donut who looked a little surprised and scared. Please, t uh, please tell me, please tell me at least it was a ring donut. Of course. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, Cause that, that changes everything. Hey, while we're on the story, the first time I ever went uh, to, to Japan, I, um, I was on a real budget and I wanted to stay overnight. Like I knew that you could stay in manga cafes for cheap, you know, like that's another kind of thing that you often hear about online, right? You know, the, the, the budget stay is a manga cafe. And I remember going to one in Akihabara uh, cause I was cool back then. And um, I, the whole thing, cause, cause I didn't know what to expect. Everything seemed normal. But I remember the, the place where I was making my reservation, there was a big screen in front of the guy where I could only see his hands, right? And I said in my like basic Japanese, uh, you know, one one night stay, please. And he said, oh, that'll be uh, something like 4,000 yen for eight hours. And I was like, okay, that seems very reasonable. Um, and then he said, rentaro wa dousaremasu ka? Rentaro wa dousaremasu ka? And I thought he was like referring to towels or something. And I went, ah, iranai desu, or, you know, kekko desu. Whatever you say in these situations where like, you don't want to get, like, you know, my, 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 my two kind of go-to responses are, um, omakase shimasu, um, or er saize de ii desu. Um, oh. Which uh, both of, both of which tend to get me what I want, uh, but anyway. So so he said rent out of a door and I was like, ah, oh, what this? And then he kind of went, he kind of get, had a pause, like, hmm, okay. Uh, and then he gave me a basket, and in the basket was a, was a small towel, a wet wipe, and a can. And I thought, oh, good, comes with food. That's nice, breakfast included. <laughs> so I got up to my room, and I swear to God, the room was, I mean, no bigger than like imagine the size of a door, right, flat. Right, that's how big the room was, and in it was just one uh, leather, faux leather wiped down bed, and a massive fuck off LCD screen, and um, a, a toilet paper on the wall. You know, like like the toilet roll holder. <laughs> but they had done the triangle, so I knew the place was sanitized. And I realized that I, I was I was in a, I was in a porno room. So obviously, what he meant by rental was like, you know, do you want do you want something naughty? Um, and <laughs> There was nothing else. There was no blanket. I tried to fashion a blanket out of the toilet paper, but, but couldn't. Um, so anyway, I, was, I, I did, just didn't have the, I didn't have the balls to leave. So I, I just sat there for eight hours. Um, what? what was really sad was, right, uh, even if I thought, well, you know, when in Rome, I might as well, you know, give this a go. I, I couldn't face it because, as you all know, a, a TV screen with no picture on it just becomes a mirror. So and all I would have seen in this room is the worst porno in the world, which is a confused 20 year old boy um, looking at a can and inside the can was, was, just, was just foam. Well, um, you, you think that the guy at the counter must have been confused when you didn't want a rental. I think he must have been more confused when you asked for the eight hour package at the wank room. <laughs> Like, well, this guy's going to town, and my God, is he going to be testing his imagination? Uh, <laughs> good. All right. Well, um, I feel like I've revealed a bit too much, and I think having everyone here has made me do this. I don't think I'm going to be agreeing to one of these again. Bobby, can you continue with the show and don't encourage me to tell another story like this again, please? Well, I'd like to open it up for questions. I think we've we've covered Christmas tropes. We've got about ten minutes left, and I think if anybody. Uh... <laughs> Uh, Brian writes, tonight's show is the weirdest penthouse letters. It's a reference I don't get, but I assume it's rude. <laughs> agreed. Agreed, Brian. Um, yeah, if you guys would like to, to chime in and, and uh, ask anything or talk about anything for, for this, our final Japan by River Cruise of the year, please feel free. Oh, does that mean we're skipping next week? Oh, yeah. Let's, let's do that. Great. That's decided. In that case, this is a double bonus bumper uh, episode. Anyone that pays us monthly, um, you'll, I promise you're still getting value for money. Um, oh, yeah. Well, maybe we should, before we go to Q&A, maybe just, just a little um, 
heartfelt thing is thanks by the way like this has been such a rubbish year for someone who decided uh, valiantly at the end of uh, well now nearly two years ago gonna go full-time at comedy travel the world and then for that to become illegal for a year uh like having this uh, has meant that you know you've kind of given us something to do every week uh, and also you're all nice and given us a little bit of money which is uh at least shows that we shouldn't stop yeah uh, so yeah, thanks everyone like genuinely uh it's we started this basically as a reason for me and bobby to stay in touch and have a bit of a creative outlet um and also it just felt weird to be two white men uh in their late 20s early 30s without a podcast you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh so so we just kind of wanted one uh but oh man also, it's been, yeah yeah it's been amazing thank thanks Thank so you much to all the listeners and to the guests we've got uh three past guests Guests on the show this evening, uh, at least two future guests as well. Um, Brian, Brian in Fukuoka is there. He was our first ever guest. He was actually over here at my house uh, and we recorded it in this same little office that I'm in right now. Brian, That's thank fun. you for, for being our, our first and worst guest. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I thought about like making a first time joke, but this whole show has been so blue already i don't need to take it any further so <laughs> thank anyway you. thanks for being my first too <laughs> we, uh but yeah but anyway yeah genuinely thanks and um and we've um, also we should mention rochelle is our most frequent guest rochelle thank you for joining us tonight this technically makes five your fifth appearance on japan yeah i know Cruise. it's exciting so what went wrong rochelle mm. <laughs> <laughs> hard to so, say we're very, we're very glad to have you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and we know we keep asking for money every week, but it turns out that's the only way you pay us if we just keep asking. So um, until everyone just pays us, then we'll keep asking. So, you know, th th there's, there's your warning. Just if everyone, if everyone that listens just pays once, we'll stop, but you won't. Uh, Laurie says, how much? Uh, enough, uh, work it out. How much would a bucket of chicken be? Uh, enough, <laughs> enough to make me climax three times. Right, now, so enough of this smut. Let's go back to questions. So that's, that's the heartfelt bit done. Uh, also, if you're listening to this on audio uh, after this, hey, thank, genuinely thank you. Um, Anne says, if we buy you a coffee, how do you split it? Very simple. I get it all because I, I paid for everything so far. Uh, so it's, so we're, we're paying all that off. And then we had yeah, a bit yeah. of money. And then I spent it all on uh, stickers and uh, extortionate international postage. So and now Anne, we're in the red again. Yeah, now we're in the red again. So Anne, if you want to give us money, then all you're doing is basically subsidizing um, postage between Singapore and Malaysia. So <laughs> if that's the kind of infrastructure which, you, which you'd like to support, I uh, know, like, but the, you know, we, we split it, uh, like the plan is we split it half and half, um, even though um, I, I'm the good looking one and the funny one in most of the episodes. Uh, right, let's do Q&A. Let's do Q&A. Should we, we should have a jingle for Q&A, really. Why don't we have a, uh, is there, is there any such thing as a jingle, as a, a Q&A jingle? What would we use normally? Hmm. Hmm. Mm, nothing really. All right. Well, let's just, uh, unless anyone has any singing ability, does anyone want to quickly sing a quick jingle for us? This is what's known in Japanese as mucha birdie. You guys familiar with the phrase mucha birdie? Mucha oh. birdie means asking, just randomly asking somebody, uh, especially on, on stage or in the middle of a performance to do something that they're not equipped to do. Okay. All right, well, fine. Well, that, at least that's interesting, isn't it? Um, all right, so uh, Anne says, uh, so I'm paying for the Malaysian Post's coffee. Yeah, you are. Um, you're paying for, if you order it in Bahasa, or, or is it even Bahasa? You'd be ordering a a kopi si, kopi si panas. There we go, I've learned enough Malay to order a coffee. Uh, cool. Uh, right, so the first question was, in fact, Bobby, this is a good question. Who are your dream guests, dream picks for 2021 guests? Uh, I have one who, who, um, I don't know if I should say it. I would love to get, uh, Hiroko Tabuchi. Mm. I would love to have Hiroko Tabuchi on the show. And every once in a while, she's a Japanese woman who lives in New York and writes for the times. And every once in a while, she tweets something really, really interesting. And I respond to her, <clears throat> excuse me, either from my personal Twitter account or the Japan by river cruise account and say, this was really fascinating. We would love to have you on the show. I'll send you a uh, direct message about it. Please respond when you have time. And she always likes the tweet and never responds. Oh, yeah. all right. Well, no, if it was someone, I mean, really what we should do is like use mob justice and bully her like we bullied. Um, oh, who do we bully to get on? 
Jake Adelstein. Jake Adelstein, yeah. Who, uh, <laughs> but you know, maybe, maybe maybe those tactics won't work. Um, Brian says playing hard to get. Yeah, but we'd love to have her on. Um, who would I like to have on? I would like. Um, I think Dave Spector <laughs> would be would be great. Uh, Dave like, Spector would be interesting. Dave yeah. Spector would be a really would be a really interesting one because he was kind of the only foreign talent that I was even aware of. Like in, in you know before I moved to before I moved to Japan, um, he, he'd be interesting. I also think um, episodes which have interested me have been academics, uh, like who have, who have kind of studied Japan for a really long time because they do know what they're talking about, and, and like it kind yeah. of it kind of it, you know it it shouldn't surprise me that someone that's dedicated all of their life to studying one thing knows about it, but you know seems that they do so so i think uh, next year we're going to try and get people um you know p- people from from that field also uh i i think um getting more japanese people on who have enough english is always interesting i mean it's really hard because we like we know how hard it is well first of all bobby and i know how hard it is to do this kind of thing in a foreign language right yeah and also like we're a particularly hard show because as you will know we spout nonsense and so we we always make sure to explain to our guests these these bits are fine to ignore these bits are not um but uh but yeah so more more japanese people who who we can kind of who have enough English and also kind of get the show enough, which is, which is quite yeah. hard. Um, all right. Should we do another question? Oh, uh, one of the questions, one of the, que- oh, you're asking too many. Okay. Next one. Uh, if we buy you a coffee, how do you split it? We've already covered that one. What's the meaning of life, Robert? Uh, meaning of life is uh, river cruise, river cruise. It's the hokey pokey a cruise a day is a good thing to do. That's our motto, isn't it, Bobby? A cruise a day is a good thing to do. Uh, Hello, Rick asked, this year, which has been your most popular episode? Good. I will go to our analytics. I'm pretty sure I know which one it was. Um, I think it was the Super Suga special uh, where we had Jake and Derek on. So that was the most popular at launch, for sure, because loads of people were interested in that. But the one which has picked up the most listens later is, it might even be a Rochelle one. I think it is Rochelle. I would not be surprised. Um, yes, it's, it's either the lockdown telework and other things Japan can't do, or mm-hmm. it's the one which is, um, in can't believe in can little pun on that, which Bobby never liked, uh, exactly. in can't believe Japan still uses stamps to transfer money to river cruise operators because that was linked from uh, Reddit little, uh, podcast hack there. Casey Bean, who's listening there, Reddit. Um, there we go. uh, so, uh, good stuff there, but yeah, I mean, all of the, one of my, all of the episodes of, tend to get the same yeah. number of listens. If anyone's interested in like does the guest affect it? Not that much. <laughs> <laughs> they absolutely do. One of my uh, favorite guests was uh, uh, JJ Walsh. Also, she was so much fun to talk to about sustainable tourism. Yes. And, um, and she's such a good speaker to like, we could ask the most ridiculous questions and she would roll with them and then find a way to bring them back and, and make them into something relevant. And one of the fun things about that particular episode was listening back to it. There are like three or four times in the episode where she'll stop and she'll go, all right, I'm going to get a little bit academic for a second here, or if you don't mind me getting a little bit academic. And the first two times it was okay. And then by the third time I was like, I think she thinks me and Ollie are dumb. <laughs> yeah, oh. Right, right, right. Um, I'm going to get a bit academic here. Just use a slightly longer words. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, no, but she was great. And also um, yeah. I mean, JJ is prolific, isn't she? I mean, JJ, the, the amount of content which she has pumped out over the last few months is astonishing. Uh, I don't think we could do it. Um, so um, Jim Pei says Japanese people who know F- who know enough English. I guess that's me. Good. Send us a fax. Um, Casey yeah. Beam, one of the clearest memories of painting my house this summer is listening to a Rochelle episode. Ah, that's nice. Very, very nice. Um, cool. Laurie Griffith says pure, consistent quality. Is that a question? Uh- <laughs> <laughs> like, is this? Do you think this is quality? Uh, hello, Rick. I think there was a. An- oh, uh, Anne has asked. Uh, has anyone ever been on a river cruise? We're going to censor that question. Um, <laughs> hello, hello, Rick says. How do you decide who to invite on a show? <laughs> Anne, yeah, Anne, banned. That's it. Anne, yeah, she Locked. knows she's banned. Uh, hello, Rick says. How do you decide who to invite on a show? Good question. So, what are our criteria? Firstly, they're going to be someone that we want to talk to, right? They're going to be interesting. We don't think like who wants to like publicize them because we, we get quite a few requests now and sometimes people just want the oxygen and publicity which frankly they should know that our oxygen is not very pure uh, and is mixed with a, lot, with a lot of other gases uh, <laughs> that you don't want to be breathing um so yeah people that we want to listen to 
that we want to talk to. Um, and also generally people that say something that we can't say ourselves. Like, I think that's most important because yeah. Bobby and I already have a certain perspective. And we'll, a lot say, of times we'll see a Japanese news story or we'll see some sort of, um, you know, something that got popular on Twitter or something that's making the rounds. And we'll look for who who is the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable about it, who, you know, wrote the article. And um, when we first started, I didn't think we had the sense that we could just reach out to people and say, hey, you wrote this article. Would you like to come talk about it? But once we tried that a couple of times, we found people surprisingly willing to do that. Mm. Um, and so anytime we see, I've joked in the past, you know, like we see interesting Twitter headlines and whereas we would just retweet and go like, that was interesting. Now we can actually like reach out to the people who wrote the headline and see if they'll come on and tell us what it was actually about. Yeah. Now it's, it's, it's the ultimate hack. You don't have to read the articles anymore. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> just oh, just oh, go no. straight you to the source. A, a really dangerous question. Uh, have you ever recorded an episode and not posted it? Oh. Yes. Yes, there is one. Technically, no. Technically, we posted it, and then the guest asked us to take it down. So you might have heard it. I, ah, think, I guess that's I think, true. Yeah. Uh, and this is something, I mean, that's, it's actually a pretty sad story, because this is someone who, until then, was a friend of mine for a long time. And they said stuff on the podcast, which they, I, you know, I, I don't want to guess, but they probably weren't happy that they that they said it, or they were slightly worried about the implications. Um, and basically we have a pretty strict deadline that like we always want to release something on Friday because otherwise you, you guys pester us. And so I said, look, we'll cut anything you want. And I edited for a solid two days, didn't I, Bobby? I was really yeah. like, I, I mean, this episode was edited I, within an inch of its life. And in the end, saying too much, they, this they is somebody who, who has a very high public profile and is in an entertainment agency. And after the fact, I think they were like, I said some things that are, are a little bit too opinionated. And what we heard from them was that their management had suggested that this was not the time for them to be appearing on our show. Yeah, and and it's a shame because what they said wasn't actually too bad. It was just a, it was just a topic which um, you know people are just supposed not to talk about. And additionally, the conversation was so rich that it wasn't like we could just chop five minutes. It was, you know, I really had to kind of surgically remove a few different lines. Um, but uh, some people are guessing in the chat and we're not going to, we're not going to say who you're oh, guessing. Oh, it's not Michaela. But... No, it's not Michaela. <laughs> okay, Bobby just said it. Um, no, no, Mika Michaela's, um, Michaela. She's been on the show. She's great. Yeah. She's been on the show. She's great. And also I think Michaela is like pretty frank now. Yeah. Michaela's been in the industry so long. She knows what she can and can't say. And also she's cut most of her ties, I think. Right. She only really yeah. does the work that she wants to do. So she's pretty happy. Uh, no, we're not going to say who it, who it is, but um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of a point of regret for me. And also we learn a lot as podcasters because yeah. we can't get people to sign releases like you do on TV. Right. Like if someone doesn't want an episode to be uploaded, obviously we don't upload it. But on the other hand, like we do want to make sure we get an episode out every week because I think consistency is important. Even if you're consistently crap, it's better to be consistently crap than crap occasionally. And also um the you know when you're dealing with friends it's very difficult because friends on the one hand make for better episodes because you know what you know you know what they know and they can be more open with you but on the other hand they can be so open and then when they realize oh no this is being released to the world this wasn't just a chat with friends but this is something which is now going to be on record it's easy for them to go hang on a minute i'm not so happy uh, but one thing i one thing i should say is one of our favorite things that happens and it happens about every month is bobby will reach out to a journalist we respect um, they will say, yes, I like the show, but I need to check with my editors if I'm allowed <laughs> to go on. And once once they say that, we know it's a no because their editor, their editor will listen to five minutes of the show and go, well, obviously, this is rubbish. <laughs> uh, obviously, it's got nothing to do with anything. Uh, and then they say no. So, um, so yeah, we, we've learned that. We've learned that lesson. Uh, Matthew Boynton, what's the rudest joke you've had to cut? I don't know if there's been rude jokes, but I think there's jokes which we just know that someone is going to take issue with. Uh, if they haven't heard enough of the show. So that's normally what we cut. It's not like stand up, right? If I do stand up, I, I'm I'm fairly happy to to push the envelope because I know I can defend everything I say. I, I I'd really try not to say anything I can't defend. But importantly, there's always a context. And I hate it when comics go, oh my joke was taken out of context. They they use that wrong. What I think context means is if someone's listened to you for 45 minutes already, then they can fill in the gaps. Right. So they know they know that there are certain unsaid premises which make what you're saying. OK, whereas in a podcast, if you listen to just one episode, you guys are our friends now. Right. You've listened to us every week for a year. If someone dipped in, they don't know everything that, that, that I think they don't know that I'm coming from it from a certain position. And therefore, 
you know, regrettably, I say something which I can defend, but I don't, th I don't think I could defend out of context. Yes, Bobby. It's also not always necessarily worth defending. Um, a lot of times you say something in the moment that you don't actually have like a philosophy or a belief system behind. Yes. It's just like you just pick up on an it, on instinct. I have, I have a memory of a joke that did not get cut. It turned out to be a rude joke that I didn't realize was a rude joke and I wish it had been cut and it wasn't. It was the one with uh, Jesse Johnson, Let's War, oh, yeah. where we were talking about um, the political situation in Asia. And he was talking about uh, slicing the salami, which is also referred to as uh, cutting the cabbage. Yeah. And it's this system where um, China makes incrementally more aggressive moves into Japanese territory. And it's just these minor, minor moves, these super thin cuts but they accumulate until you see how much of somebody else's salami you can steal, basically. Yeah. And it's, no, it's, it's really referred to as either slicing the salami or cutting the cabbage. And I was just trying to think of a random third thing that I could say. And I was oh, just yes. fumbling around in my mind to <laughs> think of this. another example. And I said, you know, slicing the salami or cutting the cabbage or, or shaving the dog or whatever you want to call it. And Ali instantly went, if we're talking about food items here, I'm pretty sure you just said something racist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, ke and, I, I kept that in because it was you unintentional. Told, you kept it in. And it, I think if you listen to the episode, I go, oh yeah, I yeah, I didn't mean that at all, but that's totally racist, assuming that you would cut it out and you left it in. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that's what you get if you don't want to edit the show. I do encourage <laughs> you to do so if you want to, Bobby, but until such time as you do, I will always be the funny one and the good looking one. Just on that note, by the way, this is a story which we didn't do in Soap Talk last week, but it, it, it's on this topic of stuff which you might want to cut. Uh, the, only, uh, the only money I've earned really in the last few months has been I've been doing these Zoom corporate gigs. So, you know, companies book me to perform stand up for them. And sometimes it's a bit eggy and rubbish, mainly because people are logging into Zoom, which is where they've been working for the last eight months. So it's not like they're coming into my comedy club. It's like I'm going into their office dressed as a clown. Everyone's like, what the hell's this guy doing? Uh, but um, I, I told, I, I was doing some, what we call crowd work, right? Which is where you talk to someone and try and make jokes about it. It's where and, Ollie makes fun of you. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but um, the, there was this one, the, there was a, a, I shouldn't say too much, but basically there was a company I was working for through this agency who has multiple offices around the world. And one of them, we always get notes about what they want to hear, what they don't want to hear. And this one was very, very hard on. We're a very diverse, very inclusive company, very diverse, very inclusive company. You've got to be careful. Or to the extent that people were saying like, oh, don't forget in Singapore, people eat different food. Uh, so maybe don't joke about food. Like just, that's how kind of overreaching they were. And uh, I told a, I told a joke, which was um, a guy at, I was talking to people about what they did during the lockdown and the guy said he learned Arabic. Uh, and I was like, Oh, that's brilliant. Like, can you, can you write it? He went, Oh, not really. I went, can you read it? How much can you read? Like enough to scare a racist on a plane, which is, is it like, is this joke, right? A little throwaway joke. Also like based on like my Muslim friends experiences of being racially discriminated on planes. The joke is about racists, um, not, not racist itself. And um, I was just sure despite the fact I know that joke came from a good place, I just, I was just sure that someone was going to take issue with it. And, um, and sure enough, I get an email from the CEO of this agency um, who otherwise have been brilliant, by the way, I'm very glad that, to be working with them and they're great, but I've never had an interaction with the CEO before. And also I've done about 20 gigs for them at this point, And I've not received an email going, debrief question um, mark which is obviously debrief doesn't mean debrief does it it means you're in trouble and um and uh, i was really dreading this phone call i was wondering how i was going to justify the joke and in the end uh, he he said um just a quick question um the performer that you were working with did they mention anything about the diversity of the company i said well what do you mean and he said well we, we just heard that um in between two of the gigs uh, in between two of the gigs, uh, one of the employees overheard him commenting that uh, they, they were all just a bunch of white people. Is that true? Uh, and I went, what? He said, yeah, that, that, that they actually made a complaint to HR about it. I said, well, I mean, it is true that we, we discuss who we're performing to between each gigs. We have an imperative as comedians to do that. And also, yes, it is true. They were a bunch of white people. I mean, what, what, what do you want me to defend? And he was like, oh, okay. It's just like, you know, I think they're very sensitive about this kind of thing. And we just want to make sure that, you know, the wrong thing wasn't said. Um, and I was so relieved. I was so relieved that this wasn't about this joke that I was like, no, man, they were great. I mean, you know, they, they were just a bunch of white people, but they were, they were up for anything. I mean, I told a joke about that. I told him the joke. <laughs> which I absolutely did not need to do. And at that point he went, right, okay, can we follow this up? Um, and uh, in the end, in the end, 
nothing came of it. But that's a that's a that's a good lesson. Uh, that, that's a good lesson in being able to defend a joke, um, but in context, because in the context of a phone call with a CEO who is questioning the professional integrity of one of your colleagues, um, don't make him question your own professional integrity too. Um, Last couple of questions. Hello, Rick says, Ollie, where's your first destination you can go when you leave Malaysia? I'm hoping to get back to the UK. I miss my family dearly. I haven't seen my grandparents for a year. Uh, that's where I would like to go. But uh, who knows? I've got a couple of dates from my Pig in Japan show, which I've banged on about before, which we'd still like to reschedule. Like Taiwan, I still need to do. Um, I'd like to do some dates in Korea. I've still never performed it in Japan, which is mad. Uh, and Hong Kong, too. Uh, but if I can't do that, back to the UK and we'll see. Brian says 2% battery. Love you all. Goodbye. Uh, no thank you. Thank you. Matthew Boyton, what's the best breakfast? Natto on rice. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. Are we done? Yeah, I think uh, I think we should wrap it up. I really appreciate everybody coming out for the live recording. Uh, if you guys want to flip on your mics uh, to, to say goodbye, we'd appreciate hearing all of your voices. And again, like in the, in the new year, we're going to keep making the show. If you'd like to uh, follow the current news in Japanese culture, Japanese language, Japanese politics, economics, in between uh, in-depth reporting on the river cruise industry and seven minute stories about Ali's comedy career. Um, For lack of it. (laughs) Feel free to continue to tune in. Thank you for joining us. We're going to call it a night. Uh, Ali, what should we say as we head out? Woo! See you next year. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.